Okay, thank you. Next we have Ella Rossmiller. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me? Is there a can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I have to apologize because I have a sore throat, so it's good this microphone is working because I'm not able to speak loudly. Thank you for coming. Again, my name's Ella Rossmiller. I'm a doctoral candidate at the American University in Washington, D.C. And today I'm talking about transitional justice through the lens of discourse analysis. So in this presentation, I propose that we view transitional justice as a type of discourse and analyze this dimension of transitional justice. And I specifically advocate that we unpack subject positions articulated in the discourse. And then finally, I will discuss some exploratory research I did this past summer in which I tried to conduct an inventory of the major subject positions that are articulated in the discourse of transitional justice in Poland, focusing on the communist period. Transitional justice in Poland has resulted in an astonishingly massive body of legal texts, official documents, media productions, political debates, films, novels, administrative procedures, public rituals, practices over the course of two decades. So it's somewhat misleading to look at transitional justice as an event as a mechanism, as a series of events or procedures, uh, when really what we're looking at is uh, something really huge, massive, kind of difficult to uh, envision in its totality. And so I'm suggesting that it's useful to look at this from the, as, as a discourse and to analyze that dimension of it. This thesis is not new. Transitional justice has been, um, has been framed by, a, the, the, tr the thesis that transitional justice outcomes are framed by a broader discourse has been discussed previously by many scholars, including David, Walsh, Stan, and Velitsky. Um, but what I would like to do is go into this a little bit more in depth in my dissertation. When I speak of discourse, when others speak of discourse, what they're talking about is a system of relations through which each element in the system derives its meaning. So it's a system of meaning that's publicly access accessible and observable in linguistic articulations, practices, rituals, institutions, images, architecture, and any other meaningful phenomena. All of these can be read and interpreted to understand the discourse. Discourse analysis permits an interpretation of the systems of meaning. It explores how political identities are constituted and how these are sustained through historical narratives and hegemonic practices. Political identities um, is a, is a term, a concept taken up by Howarth and Torfing that relies on previous theoretical developments uh, of Leclau and Mouffe. They use the term subject positions, and so I use these two terms somewhat inter interchangeably. But what we're talking about here are labels for groups that are articulated in a discourse. So for example, we use the term voter in a democratic discourse, consumer in a capitalist discourse, and victims and perpetrators in a justice discourse. And the meanings of these are not necessarily completely obvious. For example, Tricia Borer, uh, when discussing South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, finds that the report spent no fewer than 45 pages defining exactly what a perpetrator is. So these terms are not obvious. They're subject to debate, they're subject to contestation, and the definitions are, uh, are very important. So why study subject positions and political identities? Why are these significant? I argue that subject positions are situated at the nexus of discourse, transitional justice, and the politics of memory. Politicians deploy subject positions to gain political leverage, justify or discredit particular policies, 
win the loyalty of their constituency, and attack their rivals. When laws are passed, these subject positions are encoded in a legal classification scheme that carries implications for the present and the future. Such legal classification schemes endure long after political debates have subsided, and they transmit these representations of past actors to future generations, shaping a nation's collective memories. Discourses link subject positions to particular historical narratives. These historical narratives become the raw material for memory politics, which Barona de Brito and Whitehead define as an ongoing process whereby people revise the meaning of the past in terms of what they hope to achieve in the present and the future. Barahona de Brito and others advocate for placing transitional justice in the broader context of the politics of memory. By analyzing the discourse surrounding transitional justice, and in particular by unpacking the meanings of subject positions articulated in this discourse, we're better able to understand the politics of memory that shape transitional justice processes. Having discussed the importance of analyzing subject positions, I'd now like to uh, turn our attention to an inventory that I conducted over the summer. What I wanted to do is gain a much more comprehensive understanding of the various subject positions that have been articulated in the discourse. Obviously, secondary sources will reference many of these, but I, I felt that there was a need to have more of a comprehensive picture. And so what I did this past summer, it's quite labor intensive, I sifted through all the legal acts published in Jenny Gustav from 1989 to 2011. That's over 32,250 legal acts. It was very time consuming. And uh, the reason I chose to focus on the legal acts published in Jenny Gustav, even though subject positions are articulated in many other documents, etc., but I felt that, that these legal acts were a kind of monumental text. Here I'm invoking Ivor Newman, who suggests that discourse analysts start with the monumental text and then branch out from there. And I felt that I would be able to find the dominant, the primary, the most important subject positions in uh, legal acts. So that's why I choose, chose to focus on uh, legislation. So I sifted through all of these legal acts, which are available online, and I picked out those that pertain to transitional justice. So what counts as transitional justice? To uh, guide the selection process, I used Brian Grodsky's transitional justice spectrum. And uh, he classifies transitional justice mechanisms in seven different categories. The first is cessation and codification of human rights violations. The second uh, consists of rebukes of the old system. The third, rehabilitation and compensation for victims. The fourth is the creation of a truth commission. The fifth, purges of human rights abusers from public office. And the sixth and seventh are criminal prosecutions. The sixth being criminal prosecutions of low-level uh, uh, perpetrators, and the seventh being criminal prosecutions of elites. I also chose to include lustration, which Grotsky specifically excludes, uh, based on a conceptualization of transitional justice in Roman David's recent book, Lustration and Transitional Justice. So after going through this process, I came up with several hundred documents, over 400. And then I skimmed through these uh, to identify the dominant subject positions. Now, each document could contain numerous subject positions, but I wanted to find the most important. And so I asked myself, whom does the law concern? Who does it target? Who does it benefit? To whom is it primarily addressed? Now, I don't have time today to go through all of the results in great detail, but I want to point out a few things. The first thing that was very surprising to me is that I came up with 79 dominant subject positions. 
And the reason this was surprising to me is that a lot of scholarly attention in English language literature has been uh, focused on uh, the secret services, agents, collaborators. Uh, it's been focused on the mechanism of lustration. And there hasn't been tons of attention paid to other things. And so the results of my research su suggest that uh, we can take a much broader approach to analyzing uh, the discourse constructing legal frames of memory in Poland. For example, there was quite a lot of legislative activity focused on victims of repression and on uh, their rehabilitation and compensation. And so in closing, I'd like to say that it's worth examining a much broader range of subject positions and justice measures, and that these can be examined in the context of the politics of memory through discourse analysis. Thank you very much. <laughs>